craziest people live in Des Moines, Iowa. And not a lot of people know that, but they're going to now. Slipknot is one of those bands that's transcended the cultural barriers of metal and become mainstream legends. From their deeply influential sound and evolution of the new metal genre to their iconic masks, breathtaking live shows, and larger than life personas. They're a band that's legendary and beloved in a way that most others can only dream of. And unlike many other artists who spend years grinding it out or burn through half their discography before finding even a smidge of success, the Iowa Nine Piece was able to ignite the flame and break into radio waves straight off the success of their major label debut. Though this success was far from happenstance or by any real stroke of luck. Rather, it was the product of blood, sweat, tears, and a lot of dirt, all rooted in a desire to push and develop something truly unique from all that surrounded them, regardless of the many challenges that they would face just to get the whole thing started. With the band's origins being a convoluted mess of various local bands crossing each other's paths, a few name changes, and a revolving cast of characters that would eventually evolve into the band that we all know today. And while in some cases this might just sound like the average story of a longtime local band working tirelessly to make a project work, the reality is Slipknot was the product of passion, dedication, and a lot more discipline than what many would think regarding a band birthed from the new metal era. Although it's not all that surprising when you consider that half of their discography can be seen as some of the genre's finest offerings. So let's put on our spirit Halloween masks and prison jumpsuits and embrace our inner demons as we take a look at the origins of Slipknot. so long since we have seen a band do what you guys have done. You have gotten basically no support up until this point. You're selling albums off the shelves. How the hell did you do this? That's a good Let me see that mic. I think it all is due to our subliminal motivation tapes that you can get for $19.95 at this channel right here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now, there's the best tapes in the world. If you don't like it, <laughs> While the band wouldn't officially form under their famous name until about 1996 or so, the story of Slipknot goes back even earlier into the 90s. Being born out of the entropic and chaotic ashes of many small projects in the Des Moines, Iowa area, including bands such as Modifidius, Painface, Heads on the Wall, Atomic Opera, and Vex. Through playing shows, joining and quitting each other's bands, and the overall experience of being a local musician, most of the members would meet prior to Slipknot's inception, with Joey Jordison being invited to join and actually being a part of many of these. And for anyone who is even a serviceable drummer, you know how many groups will beg you to be their drummer in a local scene. So, it's not surprising to see Joey passed around as much as he was, though some of the band's later additions, such as Mick Thompson, would have far more interesting backstories. For example, he was a well-known guitar teacher in the area, before he even set foot on a stage. While not all the eventual members would form under the original iteration of the band, in time, member additions and lineup shifts, they would all find their path together. And in 1995, the band would officially form under the name Pale Ones with a lineup of Joey Jordison, Donnie Steely, Josh Bernard, Paul Gray, Anders Colsafini, and Sean Cran, aka Clown. Funny enough, Clown was actually slated to be the band's original drummer until Jordison was invited to a few band practices and eventually took over drumming duties, leaving Clown to take on additional percussion 
but keep his place with Paul Gray as one of the lead songwriters. The band would waste no time and quickly would write and record a rough demo. The demo was presented with a hand-drawn cover by Joey Jordison himself, and the sound, as you can hear, is a bit of a mix between Pantera's heavier groove-oriented work and progressive. It's got a far different sound and feel to it from the more new metal oriented sound that they would later become famous for, and taking on a much more traditional metal approach, albeit with elements of Mr. Bungle. The demo did a lot to show just how much promise lied within the band, especially its ability to channel much of the heavier side of metal from that era, all without ever crossing the barrier of cookie monster vocals and repetitive blast beats. Though, to say this demo carried a lot of variety would be a lie as well. But this demo served as more of a cornerstone for the sound that the band would continually evolve into the iconic self-titled debut. So it's to be taken with a grain of salt and as I said, it's a bit more of a cornerstone and it's something to be looked at as a starting point. Slipknot would end up taking two of the four songs present from this demo and bring them onto their first full length. It was also around this time where the band would begin to develop their look and aesthetic, mainly the masks. And regarding the masks, the band in its early days would often say things like this. Who are the masks because we're nobody? We're just a nameless entity. And the best way for us to portray the music is not being about where we came from, it's about being about the music that we want to do. When we perform our art as a group, as a cult, that we would uh, remain, you know, faceless by putting on some things that uh, just changed our entities all, you know, all together. In the beginning, it was kind of a cool idea. And uh, after a while, it just developed into let's let the music speak for itself and let's let people see what the music does to us inside and while the idea of wearing masks to hide your identity and focus on the music would be a great way to show your dedication and faith in the strength and message of your music it was a marketing gimmick and i know it sounds cynical but the answer of it it allows me to let the beast out only goes so far when masks were already becoming a bit of a trend in the metal scene at that time. And ultimately, it was used in the majority of the band's marketing and is one of the main attractions they had outside of their music. The story of the masks, according to the Slipknot wiki, being that Clown came to practice one day with a mask for fun, and soon enough, each member would adopt a mask and persona. And look, I'm not saying this isn't to say that they don't work well as a way of channeling a persona or the more animalistic side of yourself, but that's neither here nor there. The masks and jumpsuits were a unique identifier for the band, and at the sake of sounding sacrilegious, much like ICP and their clown paint, it inspired many other acts to begin using masks and costumes, as well as helped further solidify the identity for the fanbase Slipknot would eventually cultivate. Also sharing another parallel to the Juggalo Menace would be the fact that they ended up giving a name and identity to their fanbase. In this case, it would be the Maggots. So, it was instantaneous thought in my mind that our kids are like maggots. They're feeding off of us. They might not be feeding off of our death, but they're feeding off of our disgusting way of thinking, our violent nature, our, our destructive, almost self-destructive nature. And it would help inspire camaraderie and identity from their fans albeit with far less memeability and baggage considering you don't have to whoop whoop everywhere and partake in Fago orgies. But all that is the product of their future work. At the time, the band was just focused on creating a fresh take on metal music and developing an image to go along with it, more than likely trying to play up the horror elements of their music 
And with a name like Pale Ones, it's not hard to see where the inception of this really came from. But that's just my interpretation. It's quite possible it really is all about channeling the inner animal in service of the music. Needless to say, it was from here where the band would enter the studio to record more material and they would change their name from Pale Ones to Slipknot after their song of the same name. Feed, Kill, Repeat was the band's first attempt at a proper album, and honestly it's their most experimental release to date. The album would contain a few songs and riffs later reworked from their self-titled debut, albeit in a far different form. The record was produced throughout the early months of 1996, with the band still being a six-piece at the time. Though in early Slipknot fashion, the project would not be completed without a loss of at least one member, in this case original guitarist Donnie Steely, who would actually reunite with the band years later to fill in on bass after the death of Paul Gray, and even track bass on number 5, The Gray Chapter. While many in the past have referred to this as the band's demo, that's a bit of an insult to what this thing actually is. It was a self-produced and funded album that had over $40,000 collectively put into it by the band themselves, and while it can sound a bit rough in the songwriting and production at times, the money definitely shows with how well mixed and polished the album actually is, especially for a first outing by a at the time local band from a shithole state like Iowa. You can also tell just how hungry and driven this early iteration of Slipknot was as well, because the album is a clusterfuck of different influences and contains some jazz, funk, and even disco sections, which would never be heard again in really any of the band's future material. At times, it can come across a bit silly, but it also has moments of brilliance sprinkled throughout the entire thing. To get into the record itself, the first track, Slipknot, is a six minute monster and actually contains a few sections, including the main riff itself, that would be used for the song Sick. Just much slower paced and more groove oriented. The overall sound of the track has a more death metal influence. Though it's still undoubtedly a new metal track, just less overt about it. And that might be an important bit of information to bring up here. Mate Feed Kill Repeat is not the prototype for the self-titled album. It does have a lot of major elements of it at its core, but Mate Feed Kill Repeat is more of an experimental metal record, having a lot of genre shifts and greater focus on the slower paced death metal sound, and some elements of progressive music, similar to the demo that came before it, with the progressive side of things coming to light on track 2, Gently. A brilliant track that goes up and down with its BPM and even sees Colsefini belt out a few screams reminiscent of later vocalist Corey Taylor. The following track, Do Nothing Slash Bitch Slap, on the other hand, is where the record kind of shows its more clusterfucky experimental elements previously mentioned. Look, 
I know this obviously sounds a bit comical by today's standards and lives up to the name Bitch Slap, but for 1996, this is actually pretty groundbreaking and is the closest thing we would ever hear Slipknot do to something similar to Primus. On the other hand, the most reminiscent track to what would loom later was the early rendition of Tattered and Torn. It's honestly a bit crazy to see just how early on they caught onto the dark and strange tones that would lead the band to success only a few short years later. And while not necessarily sounding like Korn, the guitars here do show that the band was either on a similar wavelength or were directly influenced by them. Now, if I keep going, I'll end up spoiling the entire record, and I really do think this is one you should give a spin on your own. So I'll showcase one more track. I'm getting on my back, trying to relax, and think about the facts of the cracks, running through the back of vision and thought about the war to be proper, trying to bend the right still. I get How's no this back. for a curveball? The white boy rapping over that grooving funk beat is just a massive slap in the face after the dysphoric nightmare that was tattered and torn. I know, it's whiplash, but honestly, as corny as some of this can sound, the skill, musicianship, and sheer balls to write something like this and place it into an album as heavy as this one alone shows that the band was destined to do great things. Mate Feed Kill Repeat was released on a small label named Is Mist Recordings, and the title and lyrics were the product of the band's love for the tabletop role-playing game Werewolf Apocalypse a spin-off from White Wolf's World of Darkness franchise, most famous for Vampire the Masquerade. Towards the end of the recording of the album, Donnie Steele would leave stating his Christian faith as his reasonings. Craig Jones would originally be brought in as his replacement, but the 6-2 robot would ultimately find himself as the band's sampler, which ultimately would fit his more quiet and behind-the-scenes persona. The real replacement would come when Mick Thompson joined the band, and would bring the band even closer to the visage that we see it as today. The record would at first be a self-released affair, but in 1996 would later be picked up by the previously mentioned Ismus Recordings and re-released in 1997. While Mate Feed Kill Repeat wouldn't be the band's breakout, it would see some love on local radio stations and help further build the band's fan base. And from here, Slipknot wouldn't waste any time in writing new material, and they would get back in the studio to produce even more demos. Well, would you look at the time. It's the part of the video where I e-beg and I ask you to please check out and support my Patreon. Given that I don't compromise on the clips or the subject matter that I talk about on this channel, monetization and making those big YouTube bucks just is not really possible for me. So if you like what I do and you want to see more of it, Patreon is the best place to support me. If you would all enjoy the content or music or anything that I create, please consider supporting. I couldn't thank you enough. You have my gratitude. It was after Mate Feed Kill Repeat where the band would start bringing in the more overt new metal influence, as well as some tinges of industrial music. A lot of this was due to the more girthier and expansive tribal sound Clown wanted to bring in with having two percussionists and a drummer. Even at this early venture, designing the band's stage layout to put them on the left and right with the main drum set being in the center to give the band a quote unquote fist layer. To the uninitiated, it sounds extra and a bit pretentious, but for those familiar to the band or those who have been lucky enough to see them live, it's an essential piece of the puzzle, and Clown's directional approach to managing and producing the band and all their ventures is one of the key reasons of them being as successful and unique as they've remained since their beginnings. And I'm going to tighten up every loose end from the way we tie our shoes to the way we play, to the way we look, to the way we act, to the way we talk, to the way, the, the way we walk into a venue. I'm gonna tighten it all up. 
and it's not going to fail and it's going to be noticed. And if it's not noticed, I'm going to kick the door in. Well, the band did produce plenty of demos between Meet, Feed, Kill, Repeat and their signing with Roadrunner. Only a few have surfaced online, mostly containing various versions of the same songs. But the important ones to note here would be the coveted 1997 Silver Disc demo, which was the last to be made with original vocalist Anders Cole Safini, and the 1998 demo where Corey Taylor made his debut with the band. The Silver Disc contains many tracks that would be later recorded for the eponymous debut record, so I won't go too far into detail here, but here's a snippet of what could be heard. Now, this is far closer to the famous sound that the band is well known for, but as fate would see it, Anders Colsofini would leave the project shortly after this, with Corley Taylor joining not long before. While originally Colsofini was moving into the role of percussionist, so the band could have a more melodic lead vocalist, he ultimately decided to leave, with Chris Fren eventually taking his place. Corey was chosen due to his work with his prior band Stone Sour. Coincidentally, this brought an even more direct connection with guitarist Jim Root, who was also part of Stone Sour during their original run. And after the band's final demo was recorded and released, he would join the band in early 1999 to replace original guitarist Josh Bernard. As for Corey, he would end up being a fantastic replacement for Cole Savini and bring a much more dynamic voice to the band. No offense to Cole Savini, but if this early live footage is anything to go by... It's obvious who the better choice for the job was. As for the 99 demo, it's a fun listen as it shows off the earlier takes on tracks you would see from the self-titled, as well as some that would be unique to this album's release. Now, this is the prototype of the self-titled, and while I could go deeper into this demo, I do think it speaks for itself, and I mean, it's what caught the attention of Roadrunner Records, who would end up signing the band on a 7-album contract for $500,000. And around this same time, famed producer Ross Robinson would attend one of the band's practices, and from here, he would offer to produce their debut record, cementing the roots for what would become some of the band's most defining work today. I'm Joey from Slipknot. I'm number one, and I play the drums. I'm Corey, singer for Slipknot, I'm number eight. Sid, number zero, I'm the DJ. I'm the clown, number six, I play percussion. Mick, number seven, guitar. Paul, number two, and I play bass. 133, number five, samples and keyboards. James, number four, I play guitar. Chris, number three, I play percussion. Don't be afraid to pull on your stick, man. All right, now we've reached the main event. The record that started it all, the creatively named self-titled record, Slipknot. Shortly before entering the studio, the band would recruit DJ Sid Wilson, who hilariously was able to impress the band by showing how crazy he was. According to Sid, he was already attending practices and writing parts, but he hadn't officially joined yet. I was already practicing with the band and coming up with parts and everything. But before making the commitment, I needed to see the band live. They kept telling me, we're crazy, we're crazy, we wear masks, we're crazy. I'm like, got it, check, crazy. I'm like, I'm crazy, trust me. Apparently this was followed through on at a show the band performed that Sid attended. And when Clown came off stage to do his ritual of hyping the crowd up by screaming, kill me. Well, according to Sid's words, I was like, He's coming for me. He wants to prove to me that they're crazy, and I'm fucking nuts. So I'm like, it's on. 
and I just start running and I start leapfrogging people, grabbing their shoulders and just jumping over them. And then I'm crawling across the top of the crowd and I get up there and he was getting ready to take one step off the stage. He looked down to get his placement and he looks up and I'm right there. I grab him and I headbutt him six times. Bam, bam, bam. And I'm coming in for the seventh one and he pushes me away, falls down and crawls back to Joey. And he goes, I don't give a shit what anyone says. That guy's in the band. If this is true, it's some edgelord tier alpha male peacocking. If it's just some bullshit story, well, DJ Starscream must have decided to make up something pretty spicy for this interview. But needless to say, Sid Wilson was brought on to be the band's DJ, and as the story goes, the Nine Piece would make their way to Malibu, California, and begin production for their major label debut with Ross Robinson joining on as producer at Indigo Ranch Studios. And like any project Ross takes on, it wasn't long before the group would find themselves in a chaotic and gut-wrenching experience that comes with anyone who records with Ross Robinson and having to undergo his usual psychological torture techniques that he does to get bands to produce the angriest and most honest takes for the record. Facing in to the heartbeat and make sure that the vocal, the, the lyrics are absolutely um, known. Like, why are we doing this? What are we doing here? What's the purpose? You know, and anybody that's like drifting, you get a little hit. With the main emphasis on here being put on the drums and percussion, which was miraculously done in a matter of three days. Ross also helped contribute to the band's musical and stylic shifts, pushing them to be a bit more straightforward and cut some of the more avant-garde aspects of the guitars. While some would see this as him watering the band down, it was honestly a necessary step in putting Slipknot on the right path and making them much more distinct from the crowd of other bands doing odd and weird Mr. Bungle guitar sounds in a post corn metal scene. As previously stated, it was around this time that the original guitarist Josh Bernard would leave and after wrapping up the recording process, he would make his grand exit, with Jim Root now entering the mix, whose only real contribution to the record was the guitarist for the song Purity. After this, the famous story of Joey Jordison and Ross Robinson spending sleepless nights in the studio mixing and mastering the album with analog gear rather than digitally took place. And while the extra work and time it takes to do so might be a bit taxing, it was essential on keeping the more live elements of the record stand out, giving it the iconic warmth and color digital mixing tends to dampen. Now, let's talk about the album. I know you've all been watching up to this point to see if I shit on it or not, and spoiler alert, this is one of my all-time favorites. The album wastes no time in setting its tone with the intro 74261700027, a track of ominous sampling and static, letting the listener know in no uncertain terms that they're about to hear an edgy, angry, and aggressive album. And with the first official song coming in like this, it absolutely delivers. Sick is still beloved to this day, and it really is the best intro song for the band's debut, showcasing the tribal drumming, heavy and groovy guitar work, and Corey's iconic voice. Again, it's just kind of perfect, and it's followed up with another crowd favorite, Eyeless. A song famously butchered by Bring Me the Horizon. I'm not even gonna play this clip, it sucks. So just trust me. And track four brings us the beloved classic Wait and Bleed. One of the band's breakout tracks that would see the widespread radio play across America and put the band on the map for many new fans. And the track really does still hold up to this day. It's definitely more toned down than the rest of the album, but 
It also really goes to show where many of the band's softer and more rock-influenced tracks started, as they would become much more common from subliminal verses and onward. The next two songs on the album would be Surfacing and Spit It Out. Surfacing is probably my favorite track off the record for its dark and ominous atmosphere. It really shows off the more abstract and odd guitar work that we saw in the brand's earlier demos, as well as mixes in that newer aggression that was becoming more prominent as Corey started to take place in the band. Whereas Spit It Out is... New Metal Perfection. From here, the album shows off more of the band's experimental side, with tracks like Tattered and Torn playing up the aggressive and ominous vibe of the whole record, and the infamous song Purity bringing back some of the groove and heaviness of the first half of the record, while also exploring a more melodic territory in its chorus. The album is also home to fan favorites like Scissors and Eeyore, both packing heavy punches with their more abstract approaches to metal. In the strangest manner that had away my tears found as it lies there When my dark is red, white, I'll burn A black widow and I'll find me I swear the whole thing is just a masterclass and taking an excellent mix of tastes and sounds and forging something wholly unique and fresh out of them. The self-titled record is still regarded among the band's best work and it's clear as to why. The hunger and drive from the band, as well as their obvious excitement from finally being signed and having a genuine shot at mainstream success, can be heard across the entire record. And while some might find flaws or imperfections with it, in my opinion at least, Slipknot's self-titled record is a masterpiece, and highly deserves the praise and adoration it's received over the years. Diagnosed with some terminal disease so I can blast my head off on stage. In the year passing the self-titles release, it would be certified platinum, cementing the band as a mainstream success. And with the growing size and popularity of the band's tours and festival slots, they would maintain their growth and dominance of not just new metal, but metal as a whole, being seen as one of the most promising up-and-comers of their generation. And needless to say, in 2023, the band is still playing massive festivals and selling out shows and tours, so they obviously met this expectation and then some. They would release multiple staple records in the metal genre in the 2000s and maintain their status at the top well into the 2010s. But that wouldn't mean it was all well in paradise. The band would end up in some trouble over their song Purity and Frail Limb Nursery as their lyrics were inspired by the story posted on a website called Crime Scene, an early take on unfiction where the site would present horror stories under the guise of true crime cases. This is one of the first big controversies Slipknot ever faced, with the song itself being accused of being plagiaristic. The story they apparently plagiarized was about a girl named Purity Knight, who was kidnapped and buried alive which the band thought was a real story due to the website not putting disclaimers of it at all being fictitious. This would lead to an awful situation where Slipknot was being faced with the possibility of having their album pulled from store shelves and taken off the market altogether. The band would try to state that it was only the name Purity as well as the audio snippings from Frail M Nursery that were taken, also stating the lyrics were truly inspired by the movies The Collector and Boxing Helena. But regardless, the decision was made to pull the songs from the record and re-release the album without them, 
Eventually, the songs would be re-released with the 10th anniversary edition of the album, but the situation was one of the band's first major controversies and would kind of leave a bit of a stain on them during their early days. But regardless, to this very day, you can still hear Wait and Bleed on radio stations. And back in the day, tracks like Spit It Out and Even Sick would find their way onto radio waves. Couple this with the band's first real tour being a run on the legendary OzFest 1999, and it's easy to see that after years of grinding it out, the band had met the perfect storm in order to break into the mainstream and become the legendary act that we all know them as today. Adoration didn't give it away, Slipknot is a favorite of mine, and for anyone who might not be familiar with the band's work, just listen to it. It's some of the best metal of this era and lives up to all of its hype. But with that being said, subscribe, support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Odyssey. I'll see you in the next video.